Pathways Clubhouse and Beyond the Blues for hosting this event. Um, I, I'm really also very uh, thankful to all of you who are tuning in and I know everyone has so much going on, uh, even though we may not be able to do all the things we normally do, somehow that has made some of our lives even busier. So taking this time to tune in and think about family relationships and helping kids is, is really valuable. And I just wanna, um, I guess, introduce myself a little bit more to say that in addition to being a, a child psychiatrist and working in child and youth mental health for the last 15 years, I've also been a mom for almost 16 years. And just like everyone, um, when this pandemic hit, I've been going through all the same questions. How do I help my kids cope through this? Worries about family health and my parents and just how to work at home and uh, manage kids at the same time, which it turns out it, it, it sometimes is actually impossible. So I, uh, what I'm going to be sharing today is really from uh, my experience from a book I co-authored with Dr. Adele LaFrance uh, called What to Say to Kids When Nothing Seems to Work. And uh, it turns out that this has become pretty relevant right now as we're all stuck at home more so with our families and those rocky moments that come up all the time are, are coming up even more often now. So I'm gonna share some of that and, and just ways that we can all continue to get through this. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, show some slides. And then at the end, the last half hour, we'll do question and answer. And I really look forward to, um, to hearing your questions and, and doing my best to answer them. So the Thing that you know we're dealing with right now in a way that many of us have have never had to deal with before is the uncertainty of what's going to happen what's going to happen with this pandemic when are things going to go back to normal will they go back to normal and as parents we're thinking about what is going to happen for our kids there's always uncertainty in parenthood and personally that's one of the things i found the most challenging and i wonder you know, can't someone just give me a crystal ball so I can know they're going to be okay? And I think if I had that, I'd worry a lot less. And in the pandemic, we have these questions about how are their academic abilities going to be affected and their social skills and their overall mental health. So we're all struggling with that a lot. And some parents have said to me, you know, I just, I'm so tired all the time. I feel like I can't get anything done. And it's because we're coping with this low level and certainty all the time and the stress that comes along with it. And I think one of the things that, you know, is helpful for all of us is to kind of orient in time, to think about what we've been through. And as we try to help our kids through this, to think a little bit about what they've all been through too. So you remember back to the beginning of March last year and the panic buying um, or the panic if we couldn't afford to buy what we saw other people buying and then things shutting down and having to be with kids um, often, you know, many, many hours a day trying to do Zoom school or whatever platform. And then there was a bit of a breather in the summer, followed by back to school and the big decision, you know, no decision might feel like the right decision. Um, getting through that sort of okay, but of course, teachers, school support staff, administrators working so hard to make that um, safe and, and okay for our kids. Then the holidays being canceled and finally some light at the end of the tunnel with vaccines coming. And this has all affected different families differently. So some families who were doing pretty well before actually enjoyed some of the break from having to rush around to different activities and getting to enjoy just more quality time as a family with less pressure. But for other families being stuck at home together, um, especially when there's high conflict, has made it really difficult. And people often, you know, norm, in normal times cope by taking breaks, going out to see friends, going out to the gym. And for families that are struggling, not having those outlets, has led to a lot of difficulty. So I want to share today some strategies to help families who have been doing relatively okay and families who are struggling to get through those difficult times a little more easily. And 
you know, there's so parents are always great at finding ways to laugh at the situation. I, I just put this up because an overarching principle for I think all parents, I hope during the pandemic has been that we do need to be kind to ourselves and have some gentleness with ourselves because the tasks we've been um, really forced to do are extreme. And I'm not going to suggest that anyone has to do things perfectly or be there all the time for their kids. It's not possible at any time. It's certainly not possible now. Um, and if there are things I talk about today that you haven't been doing, I think the key message also is that it's really never too late to do things a little bit differently um, and that kids will appreciate any efforts to do anything uh, when they know it's coming from a place of love. So really importantly, you know, again, in addition to uncertainty, when we think about what uh, is going on for us, and what by us, I really mean everybody living through this pandemic, is that we are in a state, at least a low grade state of um, threat. And when we're in a state of threat, we have the fight, flight, or freeze response. Now, not to say that everyone's in this, you know, every day all the time right now, because certainly we have our times when we do feel regulated, when our nervous system, our emotional system is in this middle green zone and we can think calmly and our emotions are, are not all over the place. But under stress, all humans can end up in this fight or flight zone in the top here, the red zone, where we can't calm down. And so you may have experienced or heard of friends who've had a lot of trouble sleeping, really bad nightmares, panic attacks when they never had panic attacks before, or people who just feel like it's really hard to get out of bed in the morning. Everything feels like such an effort. They're having to kind of drag themselves. And that's that blue zone that's the freeze response to so the shutting down in response to stress. And I talk about this because it's not just, of course, parents who can alternate between these states, but kids and kids of any age. So when we're looking at our child and they're misbehaving in some way or saying something we don't like, it's helpful to think about where are they? Is their nervous system regulated right now? Or is it possible that they're in the red zone or the blue zone related to their own stress? And Dr. Dan Siegel, who's a child psychiatrist, um, gives this wonderful metaphor using the hand to represent the brain. So if you, if you look at the hand, this, um, you know, the wrist would represent the brain stem or the reptile part of the brain that controls basic functions like sleep and hunger. And then the top part where the fingers are uh, represents the prefrontal cortex or the, the planning and logic part of the brain. And the thumb tucked in there is the middle in, inner brain that has the amygdala, which is the seat of emotion and fear response. And under stress, when we're in that red zone, he talks about flipping our lids. So losing the reasoning center. And then we're acting more out of our emotion center and our reptile brain. And this happens to all of us. And it, it happens especially when we're really emotionally triggered by something. And everyone who's a parent knows that nobody can push your buttons like your kid. So as parents, it's very common that we flip our lids at different times. We all do. And during the pandemic, if we're already in that red zone or that blue zone, this is going to happen more often. It's also going to happen more often for our kids. So what we're going to talk about today are strategies to help keep us regulated, to help us keep from flipping our lids more often, and also how to repair it once we have. So Bruce Perry, who's another child psychiatrist who focuses on stress and, and trauma in children, um, gives a wonderful description of the difference between good stress and bad stress. Stress isn't always a problem. But when it's chaotic, severe, prolonged, and uncontrollable, then it can certainly lead to distress. And the pandemic is a perfect example of that. It's uncontrollable and it's prolonged. And for some people, it's severe. Um, if we have more life stresses or personal vulnerabilities and not enough support, that's when it's really going to lead to distress. 
But stress that's predictable and moderate and controllable can actually be healthy and help people develop more. So if you think of high performance athletes doing their weight training or running, they need to put their bodies under stress to grow their muscles and their endurance. And if I think about even just an example from my own life a few days ago, someone in my son's social circle had to self-isolate. And this is a, a real you know, change and a bit of a shock. Um, but given the support he has and given the way that we could deal with it together, it, it didn't lead to intense distress. Um, it's a slight change that he had to adapt to with flexibility. So if there's enough connection in the community and other supports, personal strengths, it can turn into resilience to be able to handle difficulty. And what's the main ingredient in this? What protects brain development and mental health even in times of stress? Because this is, this is the good news. I think this is what we need to be focusing on now. We've all been going through this for so long, all the difficulties, but what we can focus on, what we can control is what's going to help. And not surprisingly, the number one thing that helps children with their development and maintaining their mental health, even in times of stress, are caring relationships, especially with the main adult caregiver in their life. And this is true across the lifespan. So there was a study a number of years ago um, looking at pain, uh, impacts on pain of close caring relationships. And they took husband and wife couples, they put one member of the couple into a functional MRI scanner to be able to look at their brain regions and applied a small painful um, stimulus to the person in the scanner. And those partners who were in loving supportive relationships, if they were holding the hand of their partner during the brain scan, the regions of the brain associated with threat were quiet. So what that showed and what we know is that a loving, close relationship and bond can actually decrease the brain's threat center and make us less responsive to threat. That's huge good news. And with children, we can think about this lovely metaphor of parents and caregivers being like the dock and the child is the boat. If you think about little toddlers when they first learn to walk, they you know, get up, toddle away from their parent, and then come back for a little hug or cuddle to recharge their batteries. And we all do that in, in our relationships. So the parent is like the shore, the dock, and the child going out to explore. Another way to look at this is through this lovely um, graphic from the Circle of Security International, which is an early childhood um, program. And in, in this graphic, the hands on the circle represent the parents or caregiver. And you can see in this diagram, it's a young child, but this is true at any age. So there are two really important aspects of the relationship. On the top of the circle, the child is going out to explore the world and they need the parent to watch them, delight in them, enjoy. So if you think of a, a you know an elementary age, kid on the monkey bars and says, look at me, mom, look at me, dad. That's what they're wanting. They're wanting to explore and they want you to watch and enjoy with them. And the parent's role there is to be the secure base from which the child can go out to explore. On the bottom of the circle is the role that we call safe haven or safe harbor, where the child upset, hurt, afraid, comes back to the parent for comfort, for protection, and to help understand their feelings. So this is universal across cultures and based on 50 years of attachment science. The thing that a lot of parents forget is that that top part of the circle is just as important as the bottom part of the circle. And one of the reasons that as parents, I think we've been in such conflict um, during the pandemic is that our basic needs to protect our kids and keep them safe are often at odds with what we know to be their need to get education, to explore, to see their friends. So it's, it's very much our fundamental parenting um, needs that are getting challenged in the pandemic. And I remember when I first could let my child during the pandemic go to 7-Eleven to get a Slurpee. 
I mean, this was no big deal before, but now during the pandemic, it was really challenging and I had to think it through and I ended up going with her the first time to show her how to do it safely and to follow the COVID protocols. And so we've all been challenged to teach our kids and to show them the way to do things in this new reality. And that actually takes a lot of parenting muscle. So it's no wonder that we've, we've been tired. And the decision-making, the balancing the needs on the bottom of the circle and the top of the circle have also been a challenge. So to think about the parent tasks during the pandemic, number one is just be there. And Dan Siegel, the child psychiatrist, um, has a new book called The Power of Showing Up. And I love that title because what he's saying there is you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to say the right things all the time, but being there to help soothe your kids, to help them with their feelings is a huge, huge thing. We need to orient them to what's going on in the world at a level that they can handle. So we wanna give kids information when they ask questions so that they know what's expected of them. And the more that we're leaders in the relationship with our kids, the more safe and secure they feel. The other task is to help them understand the world and what's going on now. Are they safe? Who's in charge? What are they allowed to do? Kids really want to spend time with their friends and how can they do that safely? And we want to encourage safe socialization because it actually helps our kids' brain development. But we also need to keep them safe in a way that because being, being fearful isn't going to help anything. And we need to comfort them when they're scared. And it's not always obvious, right? When, it, when a child is, is frustrated, scared, especially young kids, you know, they don't come and say, mom, I'm really scared, or somebody bugged me at school today. They might, but more often it'll show up in their behavior, in throwing tantrums, in aggressive behavior, that kind of thing, refusing to do things. So we want to set them up for success by making time to just play with them or for older kids to go for a walk, go for a drive with teenagers or do something um, that we both like to do so that they have the opportunity. And then we can help them to process their feelings. So this is you know, something that I, a lot of families, when they come to see us, they, they think, okay, my family has got to be dysfunctional. Like I can't imagine this is happening to anybody else. There's something really wrong with us. But I have the pleasure of working with so many families and just knowing so many families that I can tell you with great confidence that all family life is messy and that this is just kind of how it goes. So we're not aiming to perfect the family environment, that kids should never melt down, that parents should never be stressed, that things should never escalate, but just how to maintain the strength of the relationship through those difficult moments. And that's the other really good news story here is that weathering difficult moments is actually the glue that cements relationships. So we don't want to be perfectly in, in tune with our kids all the time, never miss um, something they need. That's not even possible or normal. And it's, it's really getting through these moments that matters. And that's actually why we wanted to write this particular parenting book, because it deals exactly with this, with with managing the difficult parenting moments together. And you can think of yourself, you know, in, in terms of helping your child get back into that green zone. And that's, that's a role that we can play as parents, even with young kids, so that things can go in, so that they can learn, so that they can listen to what we're trying to teach them. So let's start with a practical example. And, our book is for, for kids age five to 12. It's the principles certainly apply to older kids and we'll talk a little bit about younger kids uh, a bit later on. So if you have a school age kid or a teen who says, I don't, don't wanna do my homework. I don't know about you, but for me, I can feel my pulse start to quicken. You know, I start to get a little concerned, like, oh no, here we go again. And I'd like to tell you that because I practice meditation and because I'm a therapist and I know all this stuff. This is what I look like all the time when I'm balancing my kids' needs. But in reality, it feels a bit more like this. And that's true of all the 
you know, professionals that I know and non-professionals when kids are really acting out. And so in that state, it's pretty common that we'll have a quick reaction that we might say, well, you've got to do your homework or come on, I'm sure it's not that bad or you'll be done in no time. Fine, but don't be surprised when you bomb your test. You know, if we're frustrated, we don't always say the nicest things to our kids. So I want to do a little exercise with you if you'll indulge me for a moment just to put ourselves a little bit more in our kids' shoes. So you can, you can close your eyes or just soften your gaze and imagine that it's Monday morning and you're lying in bed comfortably. You have to get up to go to work or school or do some chores, but you really don't want to. So really put yourself in that mindset, feel that resistance. And so imagine I come in and say to you, come on, you gotta get up. Let's go, you're gonna be late. It's time to get up now. Just notice how your body feels. Notice the sensation and notice where you feel it in your body. And now let's try again. So put yourself in that resistance state again, lying in your bed. And instead I come in and I say, oh, I don't blame you for not wanting to get up because it's Monday and it's so cozy in your bed. And there's just so much to do. It's been a really stressful time. Now notice how you feel in your body. So most people will have experienced sort of a loosening and that's a very common reaction to what we call validation or someone coming alongside with your perspective temporarily. It's totally um, normal that we'll react rather than respond in a way we might choose to because we're busy. We have so much going on. So the first step, if we wanna to start to respond to our kids in a way that's more likely to yield cooperation and strengthening of the relationship, we need to start by checking in with ourselves. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about this later, practical ways to do that. And the other thing to do, and this is really hard, is to drop an agenda temporarily. So there's a, a quote, if you act like you have a minute, it'll take an hour. If you act like you have an hour, it'll take a minute. And I found that to be really, really true. Um, and then tuning into your child because that's what's gonna give you the information. It's just being quiet for a moment and just sort of tuning in because their emotion is in the air. So you don't actually need to say much at the beginning. And then the idea of building a mental bridge. So trying to think, okay, what is going on with my child that they're acting this way? And that works for even little kids too. You know, you might think about it in that way and, and notice maybe they're feeling left out. Maybe they're overtired. So you want to think a bit about what's their day been like? What could be the things that are affecting them? Now, of course, if a child is being aggressive or doing something dangerous, I'm not saying you should stop everything and think. No, of course, in those circumstances, you might need to act first or you might need to act while you're thinking about it. Um, but assuming there's nothing dangerous going on, this process can take 60 seconds, 90 seconds, and often saves a lot of heartache down the road. And the, the reason we do this is because what we see on the surface for anyone is just the tip of the iceberg. And this could be a colleague who's argumentative. This could be uh, a toddler who is refusing to eat. This could be a school-aged child, whoever. All of us have our behavior, which we can see at the tip of the iceberg, but then underneath all kinds of emotions, thoughts, beliefs, sensations, and our needs. And at the, at the core of it, kids want to be loved, accepted, comforted, and feel safe. If we can attend to those things, then most of the other stuff is going to look a lot better. So I think about it in this way that every refusal, every misbehavior has an emotional translation. 
And for older teens or you know, our partners, people who are able to voice their emotions, that's a different story. But a lot of kids can't do it yet. So I don't wanna do my homework might actually mean reading is really hard for me, or I'm just not interested in this topic, or I'm, I'm sad because I don't get to see my friends in person right now. And when I look at my books, it reminds me of that. Kids might be little and they might not be able to communicate things, even teenagers, but they have deep, deep wells of feelings and needs that are under the iceberg. So in our book, what we talk about is this approach with, with two main steps. One is putting those feelings into words and the other is doing all of the practical things that of course we need to do as parents. In the situation of aggression or something that's not safe, then we flip the steps because of course, you know, you do need to get practical sometimes before showing empathy or validation. But a lot of parents and caregivers, we skip over that first step because we feel rushed or because we're just not sure what to say or we just sort of don't think about it, that there could be a different way to respond. So putting it into words is conveying and understanding and proving that it makes sense to you and that you get it. An example with the homework, you know, might be, I can imagine why you might not want to do your homework. And I'm going to pause there because I just want you to notice what word comes to mind if you put yourself in that situation. And I'd say in about, you know, 90% plus of parents, we think of saying, but. So I, I can imagine you wouldn't want to do your homework, but you got to do it anyway. It just, it rolls off the tongue. It feels so natural. It's really hard to sit there and, and sort of validate something that we don't agree with. But what we want to do is move from but to because. So I can understand why you might not want to do your homework, but you got to do it anyway, is transformed into, I can understand that you might not want to do your homework because you'd rather be outside playing. And because this math stuff is really hard and because you've already had a really, really long day at school. At first, that can feel a little uncomfortable, sort of the, the length of it, but validation works better when it's given some time to settle in. And when you're really conveying this attitude of, I'm here with you, I accept what you're saying. And validation is not agreement. Validation is not agreement. It's not saying you get out of doing your homework. It's not saying that homework is boring or math is hard. It's just temporarily putting yourself in your child's shoes so you can not only see their perspective, but voice it to them. And when you do that, it actually, it helps calm the fear response. It helps calm that limbic system in the brain. It's, it's very similar to the effect of partners holding each other's hand during the MRI scanner and the pain stimulus. So an example, I just gave one before about homework. Another one would be, well, I wouldn't want to do homework either on this nice afternoon. It's been so rainy and stressful lately. There's infinite ways of putting this, and we certainly want you to use your own words. The reason we developed these kinds of templates that we have in the book is because parents in our groups would say, I just, you know, this is different for me, so I don't know how to get started. Can you please give me something practical to say? So we developed these templates, but we certainly hope that over time, parents and caregivers will develop their own way of adapting it. So, you know, I was thinking about what's, gosh, what's it like to be a teacher right now? And also what's it like to be a kid right now in school? And just all the many, many things, the changes, the little differences, lining up to go in, having to sanitize your hands, wearing your mask, maybe your co-student is not wearing their mask and you feel nervous about that. Maybe you really miss seeing your friends like our kids are going through all these little micro differences too. And some of them are really major, like teachers out for quarantine or whatever it may be. So just sort of an awareness that our kids are already at baseline under a lot more stress right now. And there are lots of different sentence starters, ways you can do this. No wonder you feel that way. Of course it would be like that. I wish I could give you this. I can see how important it is to you. So we're, we're just entering with them in this kind of imaginary way. 
And the, the key here with this stuff is that being with this attitude of being with our children, even when they're distressed or if they're you know, happy for that matter, is about conveying, I'm here, I hear you. It's not, I always agree. It's about, I understand, not, I must make you happy. And it's amazing in our parenting culture right now, how much we can feel like our job is for our kids to be happy. And if they're not happy, somehow we failed. That's just kind of like in the water right now. And life is not like that. So we have to not look at our kids emotional state as our personal report card. Kids by nature, like all humans, go through all different kinds of emotions and emotional states. And that is normal. The last one here, I care, is different from I, I'll solve all your problems. So it's being with, not doing for. And the second part of our approach is providing some emotional support. And this can be things like soothing or comforting if a child is sad or reassuring if they're, if they're worried, um, sharing in joy. And I just want to say uh, something about that because I think uh, a lot of times in, in psychology or parenting, you know, we're focused on kind of dealing with the negative, but being able to be with someone in their happiness or excitement is just as important. So if, um, you know, your daughter comes over to show you some artwork she's done, and you're kind of really busy and can't look at it and she might walk away deflated and those little times are such a nice moment for connection over joy and over enjoyment um, so i'll come back to that later um, but our framework in the book also has a chapter on being with joy um, it might be if your child is angry you need to allow space so I, i'm not saying you know some kids can only take so much verbal information and if they're having a really hard time and you try to do this nice validation, you know, I can understand why you might be angry because I just said this thing that was so annoying to you. And they're like, I need space. I don't want to talk to you. Or they just kind of, it gets worse. Absolutely. Space when somebody is angry at you might be needed for a short time before they're back in the green zone and you can talk about it. But the idea is to really be attuned to what your child needs and to communicate that you love your child, that you accept them as they are, and that you're there for them. And the practical stuff, I think there's tons of um, things out there for parents about consequences, limit setting, distraction, you know, and a really important one right now, because a lot of um, kids and parents have been scared about going places or going to school, is support to face fears. So we don't want to encourage stopping at step one. It's lovely to do the validation and to be able to talk to kids um, about their emotions and be empathic. However, when it comes to facing fears, parents need to get practical by helping kids work through it. So for example, with homework, it might be needing to set a timer or scheduling some exercise first and then some time doing homework or getting a tutor. Who knows? There's lots of practical things that are needed. For a child who's scared about going back to school, it might be setting up a gradual re-entry schedule with their teacher or the school administration. And they spend five minutes, you know, in the school parking lot the first day, and then another 10 minutes at the front entrance the next day, and then in the counselor's office for the next day. So things like this are essential. Um, a lot of parents are really good at these practical supports, but just haven't been in the habit of being with their kids' emotions. So we sort of focus on that first. But there are other parents amongst us, and I, I certainly fall into this category, who really love talking about feelings, or that's pretty easy, but then we might not want to you know, upset our kids by setting those practical limits or making them do things they don't want to do. And both sides are just as important. So an example that I really like that helps with um, problem solving is this idea of giving choice about how much help do you need to solve the problem. And this originally comes from parenting expert Barbara Coloroso. But asking your kid, you know, let's say your, your son comes home and, and says, oh, this, this other kid just wants to hang out with me all the time, but you know, I don't really like him that much. I don't know what to do. 
you know, as, as a parent, your first instinct might be to solve the problem or to give suggestions. Most of the time, kids really appreciate if you just ask them, is this something that you want me to just listen? Do you want me to listen and help you think of a solution? Or do you need me to solve the problem? So I've been really pleasantly surprised with how much this helps. Most of the kids and teens that I see, if I had had to say the one thing that they want is for parents to listen a little longer before jumping in to give advice or solve the problem. So this is an example from our um, book. And you can see this, is the, this would be the first response where the dad is saying, Justin, it's time to stop playing and get ready for bed. And radio silence. Justin, I said it's time to turn off the game. OK, I'll be done in five minutes. If you can't do it, then I will. And I'm, I've had many of those conversations. And now this is a slightly different version. So Justin, it's time to stop playing, get ready for bed. But my game isn't finished. What are you playing? Monkey madness. Looks like you still have a lot of power. Yeah, I built this treehouse and got this new tool. Nice, it's hard to turn it off with all that's going on. Playing sounds a lot more fun than bed. Yeah, I'm not even tired. Yep, that's a tough one, especially since you're so focused. How about I help you? You can finish this life and then I'll race you up to your bedroom. Okay, dad, let's go. So of course it's not always gonna be roses in real life, but even if it doesn't quote unquote work, the time spent talking to your child so that they know you understand their perspective and you see their good intentions is still time well spent. There's a huge difference between saying, you know, you're always on the screen and it's gonna rot your brain versus it's tough because you really like this game and it's fun for you. So I'm, I'm being a bit dramatic about the extremes, but just sitting down for that little bit of time, again, that's the minute that's gonna save you the hour later. Um, another example would be, you know, a teenage girl says, you're the meanest mom ever. Of course, any typical parent, you know, we're all gonna feel a little defensive in that moment. And an approach that's a little different from what we typically do would be to actually lean in with putting that into words or some validation. So crossing the bridge, thinking about, hmm, I wonder what's going on for my kid that she's saying that. And then it might be, no wonder you're angry at me because you really want to go to that restaurant with your friend and you've been waiting for weeks and I'm saying no. When you hit that on the head, it really helps to de-escalate the angry response. So these things you know, are a work in progress. It doesn't have to be exact. It's really about that stance of validation. And my favorite chapter in the book is the one where we talk about what do you do after what you've done? What do you say after what you said? Because it really is never too late. It's never too late after something's happened with your child or your partner that you don't particularly like to go back and do it differently. And if you're the parent of an older child, if your child is 22 or 42, it's still never too late to start to talk to them in a way that honors their good intentions. So we have this chapter called the do-over. And that's what I wanna share with you a little bit now. And an example would be, so let's, let's go back to that girl who tried to show her mom uh, her artwork, but mom was too busy at the time, but would really have loved to share joy with her. So just saying, you know, when you tried to show me that video before, I was distracted on my phone. I should have put it down or told you I needed a few more minutes. I can imagine it might have felt like your interest didn't matter, and I'm sorry. I love seeing what you're into, and when you're ready, I'd like to watch it together. That's the repair we're talking about, the strengthening the relationship. And some parents feel like, mm, I don't know, I, I shouldn't apologize to my kids. They should be respectful. And you know, on a certain level, I think that's true. I don't think we should be over apologizing or blaming ourselves for things that happen. But there are times where we have missed the mark, you know, where we haven't been there and our kids really did need something from us. And I think it really shows kids that if we can make mistakes and we can apologize, they can too. It not only models for them 
how to do it, but also the fact that it's okay to make mistakes sometimes in relationships because we can always make it better. And I think that's a wonderful lesson for our kids to learn. It also takes the pressure off us as parents and caregivers to always have to get things right the first time. The only caveat to this is if you're someone who tends to apologize all the time already, then it might be just sort of being able to spend a bit more time in that distress that um, there isn't forgiveness right away, but no matter what, your child sees you as the most important person and things are usually gonna repair anyway. So I wanna spend a little bit of time now on co-parenting relationships because these have been challenged like never before during the pandemic. And by this, I mean, you know, not just um, two partners who live in the same home, but it could be ex-partners. It could be, you know, a mom and her mother who are co-parenting a child, foster mom, biological dad, even the relationship between students, uh, parents and their teachers or coaches, where it's not so much par parenting, but you're having to interact with another adult about your child. So this is a picture of me and my husband trying to decide on safety regulations for our family at the beginning of the pandemic. And unsurprisingly, in times of stress, parents and caregivers get more polarized. We get to different sides of the equation. So if one person was cautious to begin with, now they're extra cautious. And if one person took more risk, now they're fighting for that all the time. It, and when kids are having challenges, we tend to get split even more because that's a time of stress. So of course, in the home, um, we wanna be clear that safety is the first priority. And if you are in a situation where you feel that your child is not safe or you yourself are not safe, getting help for that um, is the most important thing to do because none of the things we can say or talk about are gonna matter if there's ongoing um, challenges with safety. And this is a reality, unfortunately, for many people right now. Um, nobody should have to live in a state of extra fear because of their close relationships. If we're in a situation where safety is not the issue, then we can think about um, arguments between partners as related to their negative like perceptions of each other of thinking that the other person has a negative intention so i know for myself you know if somebody wants me to go past my covid safety comfort levels i might think in my head oh they're so reckless and if they want my kids to i'm going to be extra uh, annoyed or angry because now it's getting in the way of my role to protect my kids but just like with our kids we need to assume that the parent, people parenting with us have good intentions for our children and that they're not out to harm anybody. If we're in a committed relationship with each other, then and we start to fight and you see that sort of trigger in the middle of this diagram, what we need to recognize is underneath that, just like the iceberg, are these main emotions for us too, the need for comfort, acceptance, safety. And we're all in a stressful situation right now. And I think that's why we're seeing more arguments and blowups between partners. So if instead we can look at our partner and try to validate their point of view, build a bridge to how they're looking at things, it'll go much more smoothly. And this is an example from our book where you know, partner one comes and says about their child, he's being awful. And partner two, well, what did you say to him? So that's like assuming the negative, right? What did you say to him? Why do you always assume it's something I've said? Well, he was perfectly fine five minutes ago. Well, then you deal with him. So when partners come to each other complaining about what's going on with a child, nine times out of 10, they, well, I would say 10 times out of 10, they don't want criticism for how they've tried to deal with it. And they're probably in the red zone themselves. Also nine times out of 10, they don't actually want or need the other partner to come in and practically change things. They might, but most of the time, what they really need is emotional support and validation. So in this second example, he's being awful. I get why you'd be frustrated, especially when it feels like he's blowing it out of proportion. Exactly, he needs to learn to be more respectful even when he's tired. I can see your point of view. You want him to learn some basic social skills. 
well, you don't have to handle this on your own. Do you want me to talk to him or check in on him? No, it's okay, I'll go talk to him in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. So what's happening there is that the listening partner is helping get the partner dealing with the child back into the green zone, helping them get their frontal lobe back online. And, and that's what we can do for our co-parents partners is help them regulate so they can help the child. And this will help all of our kids and it'll help us feel better in our relationships. So I wanna move on from relationships for a bit because there are some other things that are definitely helpful during this pandemic. And the first one is having some kind of structure or routine. Now I say that sort of with a little bit of um, a caveat that schedules are not for everyone. And some people like to write it down and know exactly what's happening. Some kids, especially anxious kids, really, really value having clear routine, but it's not necessarily gonna be writing it all down. It, it's more of a sense of regularity. So getting up at the same time, roughly speaking, eating at the same time, roughly speaking, um, making sure that there's time outside, at least some of the time, as often as possible, honestly, because that resets the brain as well and helps lower the stress hormones. Um, my family started doing a Friday night games night and a Saturday night movie night every week. And just having something to look forward to in the midst of this never ending situation helps us to feel calmer. And so whatever it is for your family, um, chances are something like that will, will help the kids. And we know that all the basics help and also that it's been almost impossible to enforce the limits that we normally would enforce. But as this goes on and on, we do need to start looking at how can we get back to healthy lifestyle or how can we establish it if we never had it before? Because these things are gonna really help our kids in the long run. It's nothing fancy, it's really just the basics. And using some of the skills around validation and putting into words can help us set limits more effectively and can help our kids cooperate more easily. I really wanna emphasize the importance of play because play is good at all times for kids. It's also how they can communicate. So there was a, a dad I worked with who had this really rambunctious eight-year-old and he was always really worried about her and that she would develop problems down the road. And we just recommended quite simply half an hour once a week playing with her where she gets to take the lead within reason. And within a few weeks, this had really strengthened their relationship. She was able to communicate a lot of what was going on for her just by playing with her toys and him sort of patiently being there, listening, interacting when she invited him. And for some parents, half an hour once a week sounds like even too much, but even 10 minutes a few times a week where it's one-on-one -on -one time can strengthen the relationship. And letting kids have some time for free play where they're not on a screen, where they can use toys or whatever's in their environment, um, and for older kids and teens, having some time, the whole idea of play is that it's, it's, it's not for a specific outcome, that it's just free. So that might be, you know, practicing a sport, it might be playing chess, who knows. But that is so important for our kids, especially right now. And if as a parent, you're feeling sort of too frustrated or overwhelmed to get involved in the play yourself, just sitting and watching them or watching a, a funny video together and enjoying it together, just anything that kind of lightens the mood. Certainly don't want you to put more pressure on yourself to be playful when you don't play, feel playful. Getting kids outside for a change of scenery, moving around, mindfulness activities, all of these things are regulating. And for some kids, um, before you can talk to them and be empathic, they're too much in the red zone and they can't take in words, you can play a game first. Just briefly to help them get regulated, right? Putting that fire extinguisher on the amygdala, on the brain, and then kids might be calm enough to talk. And that's okay. So the, um, the worry we often have is, well, I don't wanna reward my child for bad behavior by playing with them. And I would encourage you to think of it as regulating them, helping them regulate, because nothing's gonna go in anyway when they're in that state, when they're in the red zone. 
And last but not least, I want to touch on some survival skills for all of us as parents, especially with young kids. Um, what you do for yourself to take care of your own well being is the best investment you can make. That's going to really keep everybody going. So if there's only one thing to focus on and you have young kids, I would say hands down it's yourself. It's not selfish, it's an absolute necessity. And the more you do it in small proactive doses, the less you'll need to do in sort of big chunks. And what I notice for myself is if I don't do my exercise and I don't do my meditation and I don't talk to my friends, then I end up scrolling on my phone for like two hours and wasting a ton of time because I think our bodies try to steal back relaxation and steal back calm. And if we don't give it to ourselves, we'll just end up wasting time down the road. And I have this little picture of a thermostat because as parents, we're, we're the thermostat in the household. We set the temperature, we set the emotional climate. And if we're not doing okay, it's very hard for the kids to do anything, you know, no matter what's going on. So simple breathing exercises, actually make a huge difference. Just inhaling for three, holding for three, exhaling for three, hold for three, slows everything right down. And that can help fall asleep more easily or just takes 30 seconds to settle yourself. One thing that, and it can be done when you're in the middle of talking to a kid who's having a difficult time. I also have used this self-compassion break many times, developed by Kristen Neff, who's the mother of a child with autism. So telling myself in the middle of it, this is a moment of suffering. I'm not alone in this. What do I need right now? And sometimes it's that I need a little break. Or maybe, you know, everybody has different things that help them regulate. So if for you, it's noticing your favorite object in the room or giving yourself a hug, listening to music, whatever it is, just sort of allowing yourself that this is important. This is, this is part of what's gonna help your family. And of course, sometimes we need to take a break. We've really been stuck together and a break might mean a short walk outside if your kids or teens are older. It might mean just needing to be silent for a couple of seconds in a room. It might mean that if you have a co-parent that they need to come in for a bit so you can go and take a little break. And if you're alone with a younger child, you do want to explain to them that you're not leaving, this is just temporary. And you can think of it as a time out for parents because once we feel like we're regulated again, then we can help our child regulate more easily. And last but not least, we all need external supports because we are going through something so extreme right now. And we can't necessarily just rely on the one person that we happen to be living with if we're living with another adult, because we all need multiple kinds of relationships, intimate relationships, but also friends and also community connection. And these are hard to have right now, uh, but they all matter and we can feel lonely without them. Um, so noticing that loneliness is just as vital as thirst or hunger in telling us what we need. And if we can, making time to text or FaceTime or whatever with the people who can fill up our emotional cup so that we have more resilience to do the same for our kids. Dr. Henry says, be kind. And this is a great strategy for mental health. It actually helps us and helps our kids to help others. It really does. And to, to think about what we have, to be grateful for what we have, and to notice the helpers. So for example, having your kids talk about who are the helpers in your life. And maybe they know about Bonnie Henry, maybe they know about um, kids in their class who have done a food drive, or their teacher, who or the first responders and doctors and nurses, and really focusing on them. We can all get caught up in focusing on negative news cycles and putting our attention there, and that's just gonna deplete us. But cutting down on that information and putting our attention towards what's going well and who's helping, and that we're all in this together, 
is really going to help us. So this is Cindy Lou who and a good friend of mine said that the COVID had turned her into the Grinch and she wants to get back to being a Cindy Lou who and that's how we can do it is by noticing the helpers and helping our kids to do the same. So if you find that you know you're sort of struggling with your own um, parenting and, and just needing a little bit more support. There's a wonderful free program, Confident Parents Thriving Kids. You get a referral from your family doctor, pediatrician, and it's telephone support either for kids, parents of kids with anxiety or parents of kids with mild to moderate behavior problems. Of course, also thinking about who is in the circle of care for your child and do you need to expand that? Do you need to include anyone to help support you? Because it really is difficult right now. And for adults over or teens over 15, there's the Bounce Back program for anxiety and depression, which is also free and virtual. And post-secondary students, in case anybody is working with them, there's now a free service through the government as well, um, here to talk.ca, which is wonderful. And uh, Foundry BC also offers services virtually for youth 12 to 24 and their caregivers. Family Smart is an organization for parents of kids with mental health issues and substance use challenge, youth ch um, challenges that offers peer support and lots of great services. Mental Health Foundations is a nonprofit started by my co-author, Dr. Adele LaFrance, uh, that has great videos if you want to know more about putting all these skills into practice. And anxietycanada.com has excellent resources around school anxiety, social anxiety, really any kind of anxiety for adults and for kids. At keltymentalhealth.ca is sort of a one-stop shop for information around child and youth mental health topics and also um, support to navigate the mental health system, which I know can be really tricky. And finally, the government of BC um, HealthLink has all of these excellent resources on everything from how to talk to kids about COVID to um, just getting through the pandemic and finding your own supports. And if you're interested in our book, it's available locally at Kids Books and available online as well. Um, really uh, encourage you for those who found those sort of vignettes or situations um, useful that the book has many, many different um, scenarios from a kid saying, you love my sister more, to aggression between siblings, to I don't want to go to my mom's house or my dad's house for separated parents. Um, so lots of, of different variety in there. And I think I will end there and we'll move on to questions. <laughs>